All right. Dave said, I've got one more thing to do, and that's to introduce Ron. I think if there's a man, a pastor that in North Carolina that's spearheaded and, and been the point man for this battle and this debate and has shown up, when they, you know they just didn't want to see him coming. It's Dr. Ron Beatty. Amen. He's pastor of the great Berean Baptist Church in Winston-Salem. I want you to put your hands together and welcome Dr. Beatty. Woo. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be in Wilkes County. How many people are from Wilkes County? Well, that's great. I like it so well. I just bought a, ma a house a year ago up on Buck Mountain. And uh, I feel like I'm part of this county now. But uh, I'm grateful today for all of the speakers thus far. And I'm very grateful that you've come out this afternoon to take a stand for biblical morality. The Bible is very clear that marriage is not an institution of a legislature. Marriage is not an institution of the judiciary. As a matter of fact, they have a good track record of trying to destroy it. The reason we need an amendment to our state constitution here in North Carolina is to prevent a liberal judge from overturning our marriage laws in this state. Now, I want you to understand something, that we have statutory law that was put in place in 1996 that defines marriage as the union of one man and one woman. And it's quite interesting that our governor and our attorney general and our former speaker of the house all voted for marriage in 1996 and now they've all come out against the marriage amendment. I think I heard Bill Clinton or somebody say years ago, I voted for it before I voted against it. Uh, I think that's what's happening. But the truth is, four states already have had same-sex marriage legislated upon them by a legislature. And four states now have uh, same-sex marriage placed upon them by a judiciary. We're very fortunate here in North Carolina in that the people of this state will have an opportunity next Tuesday to define biblical marriage. That's the way it should be. The, the, our forefathers said that government should be of the people, by the people, and for the people. And there should not be a legislature, there should not be a judiciary anywhere in America that would push same-sex marriage on anyone. It should be up to the will of the people. And I'm grateful that next Tuesday we can go to the polls and we can vote. And it's not a political issue, it's a biblical issue. We recognize that God himself instituted marriage. And I think what's vitally important this afternoon, and I won't take just a few minutes, but I think what's vitally important this afternoon is that we take just a couple of minutes and look at a couple of areas where same-sex marriage has been approved in other parts of the world and here in the United States of America look at the results of it now and see if that's what we want to grace this state. Let's go to the Netherlands. The Netherlands became the first country in the world to legislate same-sex marriage upon the populace. That was in the year 2001. Now we look back at 2000, from 2012 to see what's happening down there in the Netherlands. We notice when we look there that after some 10 or 11 years, 96% of the homosexuals in the Netherlands still remain unmarried. They've had laws in place since 2001. But thus far, only 4% of the homosexual population has chosen to get married. Also, they have determined that the average stay of two homosexuals is one and a half years and during that period of time, each one of the partners has at least eight other additional partners. Now I ask you a question. Is that the kind of environment we want our children to be raised in, in the state of North Carolina? fee fi fo fum I don't think so. There's something wrong in this auditorium of thinking. It's vitally important that we recognize we have an opportunity Tuesday to do something about that foolishness and to prevent it from happening here in the state of North Carolina and woe be unto the pastors across this state that are so biblically illiterate that
that they're standing in their pulpits and advising their congregations to vote against the marriage amendment. They're not pastors. They should resign and go get an honest job and uh, get a pastor in, a man of God, that will stand in the pulpit and preach the truths of the Word of God. They are traitors to the cause. Uh, and they'd be better off to close their facilities, put gas pumps out front, store hay in the building. They'd be better off in the community than going under the auspices of a church and denying the very Bible they're supposed to be upholding. God help us in this state to vote that crowd out while we vote the other crowd out. Amen. Amen. Let's look at the state of Massachusetts for just a minute. In the state of Massachusetts, very strongly in 2005, it started a little earlier than that, but very strongly in 2005, they have same-sex marriage in place. They became the first state in America to do so. It's quite interesting when you look at their history that in the 1640s, the state of Massachusetts was one of the first states in this country that made homosexuality a capital offense. They joined with South Carolina, and they joined with New York. And they said if a person is called in a homosexual relationship, it is a capital offense. Now that's what our forefathers thought about it. They were much closer to the scriptures than this generation is. Now, Massachusetts became the first state to endorse same-sex marriage. Now in 2005, 2006, and 2007, some 6,500 homosexuals came together in their fake marriage. There's something very interesting, however. From 2007 up until the present hour, the, those homosexuals that are getting married has constantly dwindled where now in most of the counties in the state of Massachusetts, they're in the single digit numbers of getting married. In 2005, same-sex couples filled the newspapers. Now it's a rarity to see same-sex couples in the newspaper. So that's very interesting. When you look at Massachusetts and you look at the Netherlands, you have to arrive at a very definite conclusion, and it is this. As much as they cry, we want same-sex marriage, in their terms, we want equal rights, it is not same-sex marriage that they're after. Because when they have the opportunity to get married, the vast majority of them choose not to get married. What they really want is for the government to give them social acceptance of that lifestyle. And they're wanting churches to give them social acceptance of that lifestyle. And once they get social acceptance of that lifestyle, then by vast majority, they are no longer concerned about going through the marriage procedure. But may it be said today, openly, publicly, and very clearly, that those of us that still believe the Bible is the Word of God will never be able to give them social acceptance of that lifestyle because God has already spoken about that. And if nothing else is said, God is still true. The Bible said, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar. I choose to believe what the Bible has to say. I was in a debate just a few days ago with a professor, Wake Forest University down in Winston-Salem, and a representative in Raleigh who's a homosexual, and a student at Salem College in Winston-Salem who is a lesbian and a woman pastor, so-called, from Greensboro, all in favor of homosexuality. And the lies that they have perpetrated, and the news media today has picked up on those lies. They're saying things like, Vote, vote against Amendment 1. Don't let this shock you. Don't let this surprise you. But when you go to vote, you're going to learn that there's no such creature as Amendment 1. Uh, that's, a, that's a ploy of the opposition to confuse you with the facts. Amendment 1 does not exist. It is a marriage amendment. Uh, the opposite side has coined it Amendment 1. Then they come along and they say, well, we want equal rights. Now, the reason they say that is because in 1988 in Warrington, Virginia, a group of homosexuals came together and they said, we want to make homosexuality acceptable in, our, in America. And they came to this conclusion. 
In order to make homosexuality acceptable, we must not talk about the deeds of homosexuality, but we must use words to clothe what we're doing. So that's what they do. You know, and I know, that people in North Carolina, if they knew all of the gory details about homosexuality, they would not vote for homosexuality. But what they do is, they say things like, well, it's a civil rights issue. <clears throat> no, no, and it's, they, they say we want the same right. Listen, it is not same rights or civil rights, it is special rights they are after. The truth is, everybody, everybody has the same rights when it comes to marriage. A man can uh, marry any woman in the world if she's not married or not next of kin and vice versa. So it's not, by the way, somebody's already said it's not a civil rights issue. We can't determine the color of our skin at birth, but we do determine our lifestyle after birth. And homosexuality is not something that somebody got out of a gene pool. It is a learned lifestyle that people choose to accept for themselves. Just recently, the state of Maryland uh, indoctrinated the, their state into same-sex marriage. There was a man in the state of Maryland that testified before the legislature. And as he testified before the legislature, here's what he said. He said from the age of nine until the age of 16, he was molested. He said he was molested by his school teacher. He was molested by a member of his church. He said he was molested by a brother. Numerous times from the age of nine until 16. And he said that molestation is what moved him and drove him to become a homosexual. But he said, one day I met the Lord. I had my life changed. And by the way, <clears throat> that's what happens when people get saved. They get their life changed. Uh, when people get saved, they don't desire to hold positions of pastors and, and deacons and leaders and church members as homosexuals. When they get saved, they get out of that lifestyle. God will save any sinner. I'm glad he will. But after he got saved, he started a counseling service. And he said for several years he had counseled over 2,500 homosexuals. And he found this to be true. That 75% of the people he counseled were homosexuals because they had been molested early on as children. It was not that they were born that way, but that rather they were molested and the molestation moved them into that lifestyle. <clears throat> It's tragic today. You know, somebody said something a while ago like this, that on the farm, they, they, they didn't just have bulls. If they just had bulls, they wouldn't have any cows. If they just had cows, they wouldn't have any bulls. I'd hate to think that a bull in the cow pasture has got more sense than a Ph.D. down to university. God help us. Let's go back just a moment. I'm not going to hold you long. I, I've got to get up to my mountain house. Uh, let, let's go back just a moment. Right here's, the, right, here's, right here's where we're going to suffer if we lose this thing on Tuesday. And somebody's already said it, but let me explain it a little farther. The first thing that happened in the state of Massachusetts when they passed the same-sex marriage laws, they infiltrated public education. They went into the kindergarten classroom. A man by the name of Mr. Parker had a child in the kindergarten classroom that came home one day with a book with, with just several different pictures on the front of it. He began to look at the book and he noticed there was a man and a woman and children. There, were one, there was a woman and children. There's a man and children. Two men and children. Two women and children. And the caption says, all of the above lifestyles are perfectly normal and acceptable in the state of Massachusetts. He called the principal and he called the teacher and said, I just want you to know that while you're teaching this perversion in the classroom, or when you teach this perversion in the classroom, I want my child to opt out of that class because we do not believe that is a correct lifestyle. We believe in one man and one woman. We are teaching our child that. And we do not want you infiltrating the mind of our child in that classroom with that garbage. They said to Mr. Parker, your child may not opt out of that classroom. 
Mr. Parker went down there and he met with the principal and he met with the teacher and the principal called the police department and the police department came and they arrested Mr. Parker and he spent the night in jail simply because he said my child will not be forced uh, to be taught that homosexuality two men or two women is a normal lifestyle he spent the night in jail now that case eventually wove its way around to the judiciary please listen to what the judge ruled because this is what will happen in north carolina if same-sex marriage becomes law now the other side said a bunch of garbage about what will happen, none of which is true. Let me give you the facts. And the fact is, the fact is when the judge ruled on Mr. Parker's case, here's what he said. He said, Mr. Parker, your child may not opt out of that class. Your child must be taught that homosexuality is an acceptable lifestyle. Listen closely. Because the judge said, same-sex marriage is the law of this state. Now, if it becomes the law of North Carolina, your children and your grandchildren in the kindergarten classroom and in all the classrooms of the public school will be taught and will be educated to believe uh, that same-sex marriage is an acceptable lifestyle. I want to tell you when I believe that, when they're selling ice cream cones in hell. That's when I believe it. It's not an acceptable lifestyle. As I said earlier, God's already said something about it. I still believe the Bible is the Word of God. Don't you? Amen. 30 pastors in Charlotte, North Carolina, four or five weeks ago, stood in their pulpits and said to their congregations, we want you to go to the polls and vote against the marriage amendment. Greensboro, North Carolina, a group of pastors just came together a few days ago and said, we're, we're asking the people of Gifford County to vote against uh, to vote against the marriage amendment. Uh, day after tomorrow night, Monday night in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, the city councilman and the mayor have come together. and They've already decided they're going to vote against a resolution uh, <clears throat> that has to do with the marriage amendment. Now, folks, I started down this trail about 40-some years ago. If someone had told me 40-some years ago that 40 years later, I would have to stand up and drive from the mountains to the coast across North Carolina and to defend biblical marriage, I would have said, you don't know what you're talking about. Or if somebody told me 40 years ago that I would have to stand up for the right to pray in the name of Jesus, I would have said, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. But it's happened to us, and it's right at our front door. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to raise up and stand up and say enough is enough? We're going to put a stop to this foolishness. We're going to get back to the Bible. Uh, and we're going to return to our Judeo-Christian values and start standing up for what our forefathers stood up for. God help us to do that. 